Hello, and welcome to the 31st episode of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. Today, we are discussing philosophers from Pierce to Strawson. Of course, we're in the modern era of philosophy. We're reading Anthony Kenny's A New History of Western Philosophy. And this chapter covers C.S. Pierce to, I forget Strawson's first name, but... Mr. Mr. Strawson, yes. Philosopher <laughs> Strawson. All right, any opening thoughts, or should we just get right into... Uh, this was a difficult, long slog. Um, yes, this had, is a very technical yeah. episode, uh, technical chapter. I'm not a, as big of a fan of the modern philosophers as I thought I would be. Mm-hmm. I think it'll get more interesting once we get into their takes on That's ethics true. and God and that sort of thing. That's this true. is just I did like the foundations the... of their theories, really. So they're true. real technical true, true. pieces. Yes. That's true. And it was a little bit longer than the other chapters. One. So he kind of took a little bit longer time to get through it. Yes, it was it was pretty pretty long. Very technical terms, a lot of classifications and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, not as much uh, interesting stuff. I'm like sure. uh, we'll we'll make it interesting. Uh, it seemed like his other chapters it talked a little bit more about the the people, what they did, and mm-hmm. uh, their lives. I mean, there was a little, little bit of that, which I thought was kind of interesting, mm-hmm. and sometimes funny, but yes. So yeah, not my favorite. Yeah. Starting off with C.S. Pierce and pragmatism. So Pierce was an American professor of mathematics at Harvard, um, and a lot of his work was actually not really related to philosophy at all. Uh, He published a lot of stuff about astronomy, Mm -hmm. um, and that was really the extent of his publications. But he really believed that humans have no power of introspection, no power of thinking without signs, and no power of intuition. So it's basically impossible for us to just know things without having some sort of symbol to represent that thing. Um, you know, we don't just have intuitive understandings of right. concepts. You know, we just have to learn that somehow through signs, through language, that sort right. of thing. And, you know, I like this description of, and I would agree with this, that absolute truth is a goal of scientific inquiry, but the most we can achieve is ever improving approximations to it. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, that's yeah. So I, th- I think that, you know, his... Prag- what is it pragmatism pragmatism yeah, yes it's just his philosophy as it's described mm-hmm. uh, and that was kind of similar to i think it was what we said last episode i forget which uh, philosopher it was but he even said that you know even counting you know we don't know for certain that one plus one equals two that's just our theory and it's just been proven very well with evidence so it's you know we we have ever growing closer uh to approximations of the truth you know we don't just have these intrinsic sort of uh, knowledge of these things. Right. It's not like within us and we just have to reveal it, Mm -hmm. I guess. But I guess guess he he, uh, would say that there are certain things that are true or not true. We just have to figure them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there's a limit to our knowledge, true knowledge, complete and total knowledge of what it could be Mm -hmm. or what it is, I guess. And so that kind of is his whole theory of pragmatism. And that to attain clearness in our thoughts of an object, we need only consider what conceivable effects of a practical kind the object may mm-hmm. involve. So basically understanding just how that sort of object would affect the things around it, how it would um, you know, affect the rest of the world. That's how we really understand that object. We don't really understand the object itself. We just understand its impact, really. Right. Yes. How it, uh, it, how it uh, affects others in reality, I mm-hmm. guess. Yes. Yeah, true, I guess, to mm-hmm. point, you know. Yes. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, so what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Moving on to the logicism of Frege. Is that how you would pronounce that, do you think? I don't know. Frege? I, always, I, I read it as Frege, but I know that's wrong. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like was, a Muppet. Yes, it does. Frege. Maybe a green one. No, yeah. purple. Yeah. With or a, orange. With, with a mustache. Purple, okay. Frege, the, the purple or, Muppet or the, with a mustache. Yes, I think. Yes. <laughs> so so with Frege, uh, we see the kind of rise of analytic philosophy, which focuses on analysis of meaning in language. So really getting into very specific terms um, of how actually language enables us to understand things, to understand ourselves and understand the world. Um, and not so generalized as past philosophers, you know, very specific mm-hmm. aimed at exactly how our words are used to describe philosophy, essentially. Right. And trying to make it into like a math equation. Mm-hmm. That's Which where I gets... think can, can I, th- I really I mean I I, I forgot more than I uh, care to admit but I, I remember taking formal logic and advanced mm-hmm. formal logic and we and and when you're doing that you convert arguments into symbols and you, mm-hmm. and you use it like uh, fairly simple mathematical mm-hmm. equations which is really really helpful in just kind of breaking arguments down and and determining if they're 
valid or invalid, not mm. true or false. It's valid, meaning if this, if this, then that. Um, if your premises are are true, then you have a valid mm-hmm. conclusion. And that's Frege's propositional calculus, essentially, right, right. which is that it treats you know truth values of compound sentences as being determined by the truth values of each proposition. It's like you Correct. said, breaking it down into individual parts and kind of figuring out what is the sum of that sentence, essentially. Right, and I don't think I don't think people, I know that people, uh, do not understand. Uh, how how to think logically to have valid arguments, basically conclusions that are drawn uh, from specific facts that must be true, you mm-hmm. know, that are necessarily true. Uh, it just seems like people think, well, things should be that way, so that's why we should try to make them. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's not really a reason. Yeah, uh, why should they be? Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't thought of that. And so he also believed that all the truths of arithmetic can follow from truths of logic. So he really tried to put all mathematical terms basically in linguistic terms. And so he defined arithmetical notions. Arithmetical? Arithmetical. Arithmetical? Yeah. You think? Arithmetical? Arithmetical? (laughs) Arithmetical notions in terms of purely logical notions. Sounds so, like it, that would be a good, like a good um, a calculus joke would, would be arithmetical. <laughs> you really like that. That's pretty good. All right. <laughs> but what I was saying is uh, kind of trying to define these mathematical notions into these uh, logical notions. He kind of defined numbers as classes, essentially. Right. So the number two is, would just be the class of pairs. Correct. So all of the things that are two in number just belong to the class of pairs. They are not necessarily two of that thing. They're just in that class that contains two of a thing, essentially. And so what he kind of does with this is Kenny kind of goes pages yes. on this whole sort of concept. And I didn't necessarily follow all of it because it's very complex and very um, kind of just thick with information. And it all based, kind of builds up to um, really how he kind of tries to define everything in uh, terms of logical notions Um, but essentially what it kind of breaks down to is exactly that is he's trying to make math logical not just mathematical Mm -hmm. you know how can you express these things in words instead of just the mathematical concepts that we're familiar with yeah that's really all i have to say about that yeah i mean you have a good summary of it mm -hmm. um it it was it was a this was a really tough slog getting through the explanation of it and i don't know really the utility of talking in detail about this theory in the introductory paragraph mm-hmm. as to who these people are and they're just general theories. You, yeah. could, you could have just give it us a paragraph or two, but he went on for a couple pages and mm-hmm. was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, it was interesting how he, they, the that logic was studied, that type of logic was studied in the ancient world, you know, with uh, the Stoics and then later Occam in the Middle Ages and that's referenced in there. So it's it's like, it's it, it, in a sense, I, I kind of like the idea of uh, or I agree with the idea that you know philosophy kind of builds upon mm-hmm. itself over time. Yeah, so he's not just coming up with this out of nowhere. Correct. Like this is a right. thing that has happened in the past. But... Right. And the same thing is like with Descartes. I think therefore mm-hmm. I am. It's, it's kind of a variation of what other people have said. He just maybe articulated better. Yeah. Moving on to psychology and pragmatism in William James. So William James was one of the really kind of first leading psychologists for a while. He wrote a textbook on psychology he believed that psychology links conditions of the brain with the varying phenomena of the stream of consciousness. So that's what he believed that the goal of psychology is, is to determine how the brain actually interacts with how we think. Um, and actually in the psychology class I took in high school, um, that's a really kind of a big trend uh, in early psychology is that a lot of these early psychologists were just philosophers, really. They had no right. actual training in actual psychology um, what didn't just, exist. Well, it didn't exist, right. yeah. And the founders of psychology were mostly just philosophers trying to more um, scientifically define actually how we think, and that's kind of how we get to the science of psychology as it is today. And as we know, they're all crackpots anyway. <laughs> all psychologists or psychiatrists, they're all crackpots. Sure. Uh, you don't agree with that? No, well, you don't met enough. You don't have met enough of them. Yes. And so... William James's pragmatic principle is defined as this. um, To attain perfect clearness in our thoughts of an object, we need only consider what conceivable effects of a practical kind the object may involve, what sensations we are to expect from it, and what reactions we must prepare. 
Our conception of these effects, whether immediate or remote, is then for us the whole of our conception of the object, so far as that conception has positive significance at all. So basically, similar to what we were saying uh, earlier uh, with, uh, who is that, with Pre- Pierce, mm-hmm. um, but really he kind of adds on that extra thing, you know, we kind of have to make sure that this actually matters, you know, right. um, yeah. and I think that's a good little bit to add on to, to the definition of anything in philosophy is, you know, does it even matter if we're talking about this? You know, we don't need to consider every single possible effect that a certain thing might have, but just as much as it has a positive significance, mm-hmm. any sort of relevance uh, to anything else, essentially. And that's kind of how we figure out what an object is. Right, 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 right. But yeah, I, I guess it, I like the description of it. Um, Mr. Kenny says that James's theory was really a theory of what is truth. Mm-hmm. And, and Pierce was really uh, talking about, you know, what is objective, mm-hmm. you know, as, uh, as opposed to a theory of what is truth. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's kind of what I have <clears throat> noted here is that um, James's theories were more individualist and subjective. Um, you know, how do I personally find right. the truth? Um, kind of what you were saying. That kind of led to a split. Uh, between Pierce and his later followers of pragmatism, and uh, Pierce later defined his own beliefs as pragmaticism, yeah. Whereas that pragmatism, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, that made everything much simpler. <laughs> whereas pragmatism was this more individual rather than collective truth. That reminds me of uh, the movie Young Frankenstein, where his great great grandson uh, was saying, "I'm not Frankenstein, I'm a Frankenstein." Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yes. He tried to differentiate himself from his yes. ancestor. But yeah, you know, what it is, it, like, for example, when you're kind of to, to elaborate on what you're saying, there's a quote from James he's, he, where he's talking about God. Mm-hmm. And he says, if the hypothesis of, hypothesis of God works satisfactorily in the widest sense of the, of the word, it is true. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, it's kind of like this modern theory of we all have our own personal truth. Yeah. Like there is no objective uh truth or especially when you're talking about history and what has happened and mm-hmm. and uh and well even Amer- especially american history of lately where there's yeah. they're, they're kind of questioning what what is truth well that's just what those people said that's not that you know that, mm-hmm. that's not my truth i read that it didn't happen that way yeah. well well he, uh, he kind of makes the distinction here too he right. says that things have reality whereas ideas and beliefs are true Right. So you can have some, a belief that is true for you, but it right. might not be the reality. That right. might not be the actual thing um, in existence, essentially. Right. And so with that, uh, he I says... Think it's kind of, a, kind of a, a confusing philosophy to have, don't you yeah. think? I mean, if you're really trying to describe the world, I guess you're mm-hmm. just saying there's a utility in, in being wrong if it helps you. Mm-hmm. I guess. I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, he says that validation and verification make an idea true. So it's not just if you believe it, it's true. But if you have verified it for yourself, if you've uh, validated it, essentially, then you can claim that your idea is true. Well, validated to your satisfaction. Yes. Not necessarily. Like, I don't think he really believed that you could validate everything, com- anything completely, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah, probably but not. He also, seems all very relative to me. Yes. I don't he also, like it. Yeah, kind of to go into his more spiritual things. He believed almost that there was some sort of hu- superhuman consciousness mm. um, that we could all kind of take part in, um, except there's too much suffering in the world. You know, we're too disjoint- disjointed from one another to actually participate in this superhuman idealistic consciousness um, in a way, which is... If only we could all get along. Yeah. This is, this is Rodney King once brilliantly said. Although he does agree with me. Does he? that uh, God cannot determine or predict the future. Hmm. Did you miss that? I, saw, I, I, I guess I must it. have skipped over I that. underlined it on page 790. Oh, Even right. God cannot determine or predict the future. Whether the world will become better or worse depends on the choices of human beings in cooperation with them. Hmm. I don't believe in that last phrase there. No, okay. Cooperation. I don't think it's a cooperative effort. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of wishy-washy on... I can't. I can't uh, figure out my belief or philosophy about God's involvement in the world. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I. I logically, I think he that, that God does not take an active role, but then, I guess emotionally, I want him to. For her. I guess that makes an amount of sense. Thank you for that. Praise. You're you're welcome. <laughs> Faint <laughs> praise. I Maybe. guess that makes sense as he rolls his eyes. I did not roll my eyes. 
I, li- the li- viewer saw it. Okay. <laughs> You're lying to all our viewers. <laughs> Which, speaking of, um, I'm going to be putting all of these episodes on YouTube. Um, why would you do that? Why not? Well, you're the one proposing it, so why would you do that? Well, it's just another platform. I am opposed to the You're to opposed. YouTube. You're opposed. Why is that? For two reasons. One, they censor people. Okay. Uh, and two, I am not in favor of widespread exposure. Uh, We're already on all of the podcast platforms but, we're on spotify nobody, we're on apple we're no, on amazon no, no, nobody we're, nobody we're on yet, google nobody yet listens to us and you keep trying to push this out there with your twitters and your tweets and now youtube all right fine <laughs> i was spoken like a real old man <laughs> i am a real old man i don't like all these newfangled things i you know i have uh i've sworn i will never get in politics again uh, but if if I ever get in politics, it will just to be to, to destroy big tech. Really? That'll, that'll be the the sole purpose of my life at that point. Um, so if I like, I'd have to win the lottery, like mm-hmm. the big one, like the Powerball. I quit my job and I'm running for Congress. And the sole campaign promise would be to destroy big tech. I would vote for you. Uh, and I mean, I'm not just talking about oh, we need to regulate it. I mean, to destroy it, burn it all down. Burn it all down to the ground, and incarcerate, on that. <laughs> and incarcerate those criminals that have been running it, mm-hmm. and have been. I just got. I just got uh, another warning on my Facebook page. Oh, you've for, been exposed to extremist content. No, 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 no. I'm the one exposing people because really, oh. I don't. I don't get exposed. <laughs> I expose. No, I. I. Uh, well, I'm gonna go along. This is. I'm sorry, but we're gonna go off this tangent. Uh-huh. So there was a, a, a journal article in the Journal of uh, J- JAMA Pediatrics. Mm-hmm. So Journal of uh, whatever, medical, blah, 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 J-A-M-A, prestigious uh, journal, which questioned the effectiveness and the health uh, of using uh, masks on children because the CO2. I don't mm-hmm. think it really is an accurate uh, study because... I don't think any of these kids are wearing the mask properly to to limit the yeah. exhale. But but they did a study and they said there's a risk that they're they have too much CO two because they're not able to expel enough of the CO two. It's like like slowly suffocating. Oh Jesus! But you know not suffocating, but you know they're, mm-hmm. they're having a higher level of CO two. And so there's a study mm-hmm. published saying, hey, you know maybe we shouldn't have these little kids wearing masks. Yeah. I mean, and, and so I uh, posted that. Of course, my comment to it was, you know, this is child abuse because I mm-hmm. believe having children wear masks. For something that has almost no risk to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody, no child is dying from COVID. I think there's been one death in the United States for a child for COVID. I'm sure he was fat or she was fat. You know, probably 200 plus pounds. I mean, I, I don't know that because I don't know who the person is because they don't release that information. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bet you $100. It was a morbidly obese kid or some other kid that was dying of cancer anyway not that we you know it's not that important you know <laughs> every life is important or whatever but when you're making public policy you shouldn't decide it on emotions yeah mm-hmm. it's it's, it's kind of like a math equation you, you know if you do something on this end of it you're tipping the scales on the other end mm-hmm. and you're going to cause more mayhem and more death and more misery but anyway so they they put a warning on it saying it's partly false so that's what I was reading before we came up to this podcast of the the Facebook experts. And all they said was, yeah, we disagree. We disagree that... What's the Department that, of Truth? But, but it, it, it's not that it was false. Mm-hmm. It's just they had found some other experts that say, we disagree with this journal that's published in a, in a reputable scientific magazine. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, but they're not even publishing a counter study. Yeah. Or even really criticism of the methods of the study itself. Mm-hmm. They're not saying the study's invalid. They're just saying, well, we disagree because we think they're fine or we think the benefits outweigh the cost. Well, that doesn't mean that the study's false or that my post quoting the study is false, but they mark it as partly false. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to partly burn them to the ground <laughs> if given the chance. And then we can argue about whether it's completely burned to the ground or partly. I, I like that. I think you have a lot of support. Yes. yes. Moving on to British idealism and its critics. So one of the first British idealists was T.H. Green, and he believed in the spiritual idealism and that we're all related to one spiritual and self-conscious being and that, you know, all humans can kind of join together almost in 
a, some sort of spiritual fashion. Um, it's kind of like, kind of, I think I pointed this out like a couple episodes ago, but, um, you know, people kind of in replacing God with, you know, the universe and that you are the universe looking at itself, that sort of thing. Right. Um, almost that sort of collective um, as a whole part of the universe, part of this whole consciousness sort of um, idealistic view. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think they're, it's interesting in that they're kind of rejecting that dualism. You mm-hmm. have a separate mind, separate body. It's all kind of one part of yeah. the whole, which kind of gets around the, the, the problems with, with the dualism. That mm-hmm. You have a separate soul from your physical body. Yeah. Well, it's all wrapped into one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't, I don't like how this, you know, this whole, it's like a Gaia, you yeah. know, like we're all part of the life being or, you know, or, mm-hmm. you know, Star Wars, where it's all the force, you mm-hmm. know, we're all connected with force flows through you and yeah. of you. And okay. And they kind of differ from the, the pragmatists here too, um, because they believe that reality is spiritual in nature and that truth belongs to judgments about being as a whole. Mm-hmm. So not so much as breaking things down to, you know, is this true and is this true, adding it up and that sort of thing. But is this true as a whole for all of being? essentially right they also believe that every item is related to every other item um so in effect you know all of the universe is wholly connected and interconnected that sort of thing i think there's a factual basis for Mm -hmm. that yes i mean we're we're all we all have molecules and and as they say like that uh i don't know that's a kind of low level radiation that flows through everything it seems Mm -hmm. like yeah yeah i mean i think they're onto something there now what what meaning it has with regard to you know, our soul and Mm -hmm. eternal life and the nature of Mm -hmm. mind and being. I don't know. Yeah. One of their big critics was G.E. Moore, who differed from them because he believed that to exist is different from being perceived. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of where um, Mm -hmm. the idealistic view is, is that, you know, existence is just being perceived um, and that we're all part of like the same sort of consciousness. And that's how we exist is perceiving each other. You believe that objects of our knowledge are independent of our knowledge of them. So it's kind of like that, old um you know if a tree falls mm-hmm. in a forest and it doesn't make a sound does it still right or, or nobody hears it does it still make a sound and ge moore would say well yeah it still made a sound even if you weren't there to perceive it it still happened you know right. our knowledge of an event um does not you know impact the event itself do you ever um uh, uh, have you heard the the term npc like uh what they call it non-player character well yeah that's a video game term yes yes do you ever go through life and view a lot of people as NPCs in your life? <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah, yes. I mean, so is, and I, I, I'm really bad at that. We're, we're talking about perception and mm-hmm. whether or not, you know, we're all part of the same consciousness. I don't really feel like I'm part of everybody else's consciousness. I, I don't, uh, you know. Well, I think we definitely have. Oh, well. So you, wait, what are you saying exactly? Are you saying like you don't feel like you're perceived by other people? I'm saying I don't perceive other people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, at, 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 sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, uh, whether or not I'm perceived by them, mm-hmm. I don't think it affects me at all. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, I kind of feel that sometimes with like just people like I pass on the street or that sort of Correct. thing. Like you're going through the mall. Like it's easy to tell like my friends or, you know, my family, like, sure, they have, you know, a personality. They're not, you know, just mindless, whatever. Like they perceive me, I perceive them. But I do think that, yeah, it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around that every stranger, all like almost 8 billion people in the world now right. have their own you know, separate goals consciousness and, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and, and reality and mm-hmm. perception. Yeah. And do you ever, uh, and this was making me think of, um, I was reading this, it happens to me because I have a terrible memory for names and faces, so mm-hmm. it's a dual deficit. Um, and so I'll meet people who know me and uh, and know, I mean, know my name, yeah. know my kids, know where I work. And it takes me a while for me to even remember who the hell these people are. Mm-hmm. And uh, it happened to me over the weekend. Your mom and I went dancing. That's a new thing we're doing. Not new for her, but new for me. Mm-hmm. And we ran into, and, and and I would have sworn on a stack of Bibles <laughs> that I've never met this person before. And uh, but it is my it, she what she is my oldest sister's sister in law. Oh, and your mother, of course, remembered her mm-hmm. after a minute, you know, because we hadn't seen her in, in a long time, a couple of years or whatever. And I, I mean, she's in 
in-law of my sister. Yes. If I don't see that often anyway, but, but she knew everything about me. And, and, uh, and I'm like, even after I realized who she was, mm-hmm. I still didn't know who she was. Yeah. I didn't know anything about her. I just know, okay, that's Monica's sister-in-law. But, um, uh, but before she came over and talked to us, she was in my perception, an NPC. Mm-hmm. She was just somebody there in the room while I'm dancing with your mother. Yeah. And I, I think you go through life too much like that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think it is important to recognize that other people, you know, are individuals. Other people, they are individuals. They're not just part of a co- collective, you know, them. Yeah, I, I don't even think of them as, as, I don't think, I don't think of them like in a devaluing sense, like they don't mm-hmm. have importance and they're not their own self and they don't have interest in value as a human being, which they do. I just don't even consider, you know. They don't just don't know. have any impact on you, I guess. Right. Like, sure, they, they have importance. In... If I consider it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if somebody asked me, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're you know, great people, whatever, yeah. you know, and they should, you know, be free from all pain and suffering and all that stuff. Yes. But, but unless prompted, I don't even think of it. Is that bad? I think that's bad. I think that's a little bad. I think. Well, do you do that? I mean, like, if you're going through the store, do you think, do you notice people as individuals or do you just perceive them as similar to NPCs? Like, okay, I'm going to down this aisle and there's a person coming the other way, so I'm going to move aside. And I'm going to move, you know, it's like, like I'm steering the, the character, my character through the aisle. I don't really perceive them as, unless I know them or they interact with me. Yeah. Like because then like if one of those characters starts coming up to you and starts talking, well then you have to interact with them. Oh, that's that's a, another character or something. Yeah, I don't know. I'm pushing the analogy. Okay. I don't we'll know. go off a different tangent. Yeah, that's that that a very different tangent. But But I mean it's kind I of like it, this consciousness that, thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, do we really do, are we really affected by other people's consciousness and can we be without interaction verbally or through direct communication? Is is my consciousness can I, can my consciousness be connected to anybody else without direct communication with that person? I would say no. I'm thinking like nonverbal, verbal, written word. I think it's no. Like, well, I mean, I guess it de- depends on what you're talking about. Like, I think in a way, like when you read a book or something, then in, in some fashion, you're connected almost to the consciousness yes. of the author of that book. I agree with that. But yes. that's why I said written word. So, I mean, that's okay, a so, kind so of, just, I feel that's a... So, like, no contact with anything they've created, anything, they, they have never said anything to you. Well, let's... let's You'll let's, never meet them in your life. Yeah, let, yeah, let's go to that that example where we, we people, there's a lot of people we'll never meet. Mm-hmm. So... Almost are, 8 billion, are, <laughs> billion of them. Right. Are, are we... Are we somehow connected to them through the global consciousness of human beings and all that stuff? Then I would say no. Yeah, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've just refuted their argument. Yes. Very expertly and without room for error. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on to Russell on mathematics, logic, and language. (laughs) So Russell hoped not only to show that math uh, was derived from logical axioms, but geometry and analysis as well. So basically all of these principles that had in the past kind of been just accepted as, well, yeah, those are just true. Um, we don't have to worry about those. He wanted to prove that those are all derived from logic. And he believed that the number of objects in the universe is not finite because uh, he tried to avoid, um, Kenny kind of described some paradoxes within this sort of class system that we saw earlier. Um, this was kind of his way to work around those sort of paradoxes and that saying that the number of objects is not uh, finite, um, but it's really not too important to go into that whole paradox because we didn't go too into detail with that system in the first right. place. I thought the most interesting thing about this guy was that he wrote his uh, uh, introduction to mathematical philosophy while he was serving a prison sentence Mm -hmm. as an anti-war protester back in 1917. Yes, that was very interesting. And really his whole, um, to basically summarize his sort of concept, he kind of furthered this analytical philosophy and he kind of defined analysis as understanding holes by understanding parts. Mm -hmm. You know, to understand, Mm -hmm. you know, what is actually going on in the big picture have to break it down into the smaller picture. Right. And, and that's essentially what a lot of these analytical philosophers did. Um, very, very focused on language. And moving on to, uh, again onto his personal life. I thought this was a, a really interesting way to describe his personal life. Where he said he became famous for his unorthodox nature of his moral ideas and notorious for the breakdown of his successive marriages. <laughs> and he was later declared unfit to teach by the state Supreme Court. I just thought that was fascinating. Yeah. Of New York, he wasn't the one that like. No, never mind. 
That was somebody else. We'll get to him. Yeah, we'll get to him later. Yes. I'm, I'm always fascinated by their personal life. I, I think it was Pierce was destitute. Yeah. In later life. And and some of them are super wealthy. Mm-hmm. You know, they inherited wealth and they had all this wealth. And that's why they had the time and leisure to to uh, write these things. But then you have, uh, you know, Marx, whose kids are starving and he's writing books mm-hmm. and stuff. And, and it's just kind of fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Russell also believed that every proposition must be composed wholly of items that we are acquainted with. So really, when you break down a sentence um, and you kind of look at everything in a sentence, even if there's, you know, a proper name of somebody, he kind of points to Queen Elizabeth. You know, we've never been acquainted acquainted with Queen Elizabeth, but we know of her through description. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of break down Queen Elizabeth into her parts. You know, she was a queen at this time and we're kind of familiar with the concept of years and dates and that sort of thing. So really, he kind of really took um, this whole analytical approach a step further, kind of saying that every word, essentially, if it's not a very simple, like atomic mm-hmm. word, can right. be broken down further into these atomic words that build up into forming these more complex sentences that we just are familiar with via description, yeah. essentially. Hence the philosophy of logical atomism. Yes. Which is what he called it. Yes. Moving on to Wittgenstein's Tractatus. So he believed uh, Wittgenstein, uh, I believe his name was Ludwig, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. A schoolboy school contemporary of Adolf Hitler. Of yes. All eh, well, somebody had to go to school with him. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> he believed that philosophy is not a deductive discipline and is not among the natural sciences. So uh, he really believed that philosophy's task was not to find the truth. It's really mm. just to look at what we know and kind of categorize it essentially, right? Not not like a scientific explanation mm-hmm. or exploration, uh, more of a a, uh, a description of mm-hmm. what we perceive reality yes. as. And he developed this picture theory of meaning, which was very unusual, I think, because he believed mm-hmm. that really sentences in language is formed um, in relation to how things are actually laid out spatially, essentially. And he kind of uses the example, you know, if you wrote down the sentence, "The fork is left of the knife." then literally in that sentence, if you're looking at it, the fork is literally left of the knife. The, the word fork is left mm-hmm. of the word knife, similar to how it would be in space. Um, and he goes on to kind of describe how that's used in more complex sentences when they're not just, this is to the left of this, this is to the right of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but his whole theory is that really language is formed um, to create pictures, essentially. Um, and that's how we've gotten to the language that we are at today. Um, it's just very, very complexly hidden within our sentence structure yeah what do you um, think of that i was i was wondering what you thought of this as i was reading it because I, I thought it seemed like there's some truth to it what do you think i think there's an amount of truth in that a lot of well you know the the letters we use today are derived from pictures of course um but uh like that that's like pic- what do you mean by derived from pictures? Like, like pic- if you look at the Latin, yeah, if you look at the Latin al- alphabet and you go back, you know, thousands of years, you can kind of trace how these letters developed over time um, to just form sounds. Because uh, really, all languages started as pictorial things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, think hieroglyphics or right. uh, that sort of thing. And over time, um, you know, the languages that survived, you know, is more beneficial to use letters rather than pictures um, to kind of. Uh, because that just gives you more freedom because you don't have to draw a picture for every word. You can just arrange the letters to make the sounds of that word, that sort of thing. But I don't really see where he's coming from with that, like sentences are physically laid out to describe pictures. Because, mm-hmm. well, things wouldn't have been written down before they were spoken. Because, mm-hmm. you know, language developed orally before it was ever right. developed written. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, I, I, I don't think that's true. I don't really... Well, it is, uh, but is... The written word really just a different way to communicate the oral? Yeah, so, it is. So, he, he kind of he kind of says that too. Right. He kind of tries to provide his understanding of how it works, you know, kind of orally. Um, but I really don't think it's that detailed, I guess. Okay. Right. I think a lot of Close language enough. is almost random to a point until it is, um, you know, hmm. actually more structured over time. But Interesting. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was wondering through this whole chapter, which, I, it, like I said at the beginning, was like a long slog. And mm-hmm. I, I thought you'd be more interested in it because there's so much about logic. I'm mean, sorry, so much about language mm-hmm. and how it uh, affects you know logical arguments. Mm-hmm. And, it is interesting uh, to me, but it does get really bogged down yeah. in the details here. Right. Moving on to logical positivism. Wait, before we get to that, oh, I need to point out. Uh, I need to point out 
that uh, Wittgenstein yes, this is, uh, yes. uh, was charged with sadistic punishment as a teacher, uh, which was brought on behalf of one of his pupils. Uh, he was acquitted, but it brought his school teaching career to yes, an that's, end. I, I thought that was Russell for a second, who was yeah. the sadistic punishment, but nope, that was Wittgenstein. Well, he was only accused. He was never convicted. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So logical positivism. I um, really want to know what he was accused of doing. I should yeah, have to look that up. Or we should have. So, uh, positive, sorry. Yes, positivism, this kind of expanded on Wittgenstein's beliefs mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, this logical linguistic theory. Um, these positivists believe that metaphysics is just kind of completely outdated and that experience and science combats metaphysics, yeah. uh, you know, their theories of verification. Because yep. um, really they ask, they say the question, you know, if you're going to ask any metaphysician, um, you know, they, they dispute, you know, the nature of the absolute or the purpose of the universe. You know, right. you can silence them by asking the question, what possible experience would settle the issue between you? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if you're put into a scenario that would give you absolute proof of yes or no, um, you know, is that an, even a scenario that can happen? And really what he's kind of saying here is that's not a scenario that can happen. This can right. never be proven either way. Um, and so that's why these logical positivists uh, became really popular at this time is that they actually had more or less an answer more than the metaphysicians. You know what I thought was the most the, the most interesting part of this whole book is like these guys, these positives as, positivists, as they're trying to hash this stuff out in, I think it was Vienna, wasn't mm-hmm. it? They had a discussion group yes. that met on a regular basis to talk about things. And I think I'd like to have a discussion group. Really? I but, would too. But I don't know who I'd want to invite. Yes. <laughs> yeah, That's true. Have the right caliber person. That would be uh, willing to discuss these kind of issues and have kind of a, a, a you know a dinner gathering or a discussion group that wouldn't get bogged down into nonsense or stupidity yeah. or and stay interesting. But uh, we me, should we should organize one. Well, you're going off to college. Uh-huh. We have a so, month. <laughs> <laughs> About a month and a half. I think I'll, 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 have to, I'll have to think on that because I might have some interesting cats that yeah. I'd have to get. I'd have to talk to them into coming to to the discussion group. But if I had, if I got a couple people to agree, then uh, if they all knew each other somewhat, they maybe for maybe be able to expand the group to maybe five people or something. Yes. So going on back to Wittgenstein, uh, or one more thing about the logical positivists. Positive, yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, really, they kind of hit this issue, you know, with this idea of verification. You know, kind of the belief that everything has to be verified by experience. Right. Is that well, we all have varying experiences and senses, you know, how can we really, um, it's kind of that question. I think we've asked this several times, you know, if I look at the sky and I see what is blue to me, but right. it's really what is uh, red to you, but we both mm-hmm. just call it blue. Um, you know, how do we know that our senses are reliable? How do we know that our experiences are reliable? That sort of thing. Um, right. So maybe that's why, uh, one of these guys Schlick was shot dead by his disgruntled student. <laughs> Golly, the other guy was, other guys were forced into exile uh-huh. of this discussion group. Yes, you know, and the the cool. only uh, publication of anything was written by a guy who never actually fully paid the dues to yeah. enter the group. So <laughs> that's right. He was oh, to have dues too. <laughs> you will get no people to show up. I won't even show up. I have to pay them. Yeah. I have to pay the dues. It's an assessment just for them to show up. I pay you what? So after talking about this logical positivism, Kenny goes back to Wittgenstein, um, his later philosophy, uh, because... Which is different. Which is different. He completely stopped believing in these logical atoms. He kind of, you know, realized, well, is it really, is there really any point in doing this? Right. You know, when we really get down to it, you know, what does it even matter? Which I think is kind of a similar thing that we've been saying throughout most of the 31 episodes of this podcast is how much of this actually (laughs) happens, how much of this actually matters. I think it, I think after you do so me, so much of this mm-hmm. thinking and discussing, I think you you just come to a better understanding of what you you think and what you believe. Yeah. After you start considering all these other arguments and kind of like, eh, no, mm-hmm. eh, maybe, you know. Yeah. And what he really believed now that the problem of philosophy was is to do justice to private internal thought in context of the social. So really, how do we expand mm-hmm. what we already believe, you know, and share that with other people? Because that's I think that's really um, a big question. Really, how do we actually 
vocalize our own thoughts? How do we make them make sense to other people? Right, right. But he still had a very, very strong emphasis on language because he believed that language is interwoven in the world in many ways. And he called these language games, um, not so much that it was trivial, but in the same way that, you know, games has a wide variety of meaning in the same way that we use language in a wide variety of meaning as well. Um, he, he Just a couple of these examples, you know, giving orders, expressing sensations, reporting an event, you know, guessing riddles, telling jokes, you know, so much of our life is just completely centered around language. Um, but how True. do we then use that language to voice our internal thoughts and share our ideas with other people? And he believed that, you know, therein lies the kind of the solution of philosophy because philosophy keeps us from being trapped in language. Um, it keeps us from being, um, you know, kind of lost. And how do we describe this? Uh, philosophy kind of frees us up to describe ourselves more fully. You know, if we understand what we believe, then we can help other people understand what we believe as well. Mm -hmm. That should be my goal for the rest of my life to show what other people, what I believe, mm -hmm. communicate that because they would benefit from it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Saying some prayers today, are you, Adam? Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're done with him, yes. right? Moving on to analytic philosophy after, after Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein. A lot about Wittgenstein. Yes. Uh, but he was very prominent. Uh, I think Kenny does mention that, oh, yeah. that most of the teaching, you know, after he kind of developed his ideas was centered around um, him. You know, a lot of the teaching in the West was centered oh, around, yeah. you know, whether you agree or disagree with Wittgenstein. So the first mm -hmm. of these philosophers was, I think that says... Gilbert? I can't read my own handwriting. Yes. Gilbert Ryle. Gilbert Ryle. Yes. R-Y-L-E. Yes. Professor of metaphysics at Oxford. Mm -hmm. He was very anti-Cartesian, and he very strongly believed that there was a difference between knowing how and knowing that. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of where uh, Descartes got very bogged down, if you remember, I don't know, 10 episodes ago. Um, and, you know, how do we actually describe what a thing is? And, you know, how do we actually understand that thing are two different concepts. Right. Um, that was really he was, what he was very big on is how do we actually use analysis to determine that. And then W.V.T. Quine. I think I it's Quine. Quine, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So he uh, kind of set up the framework for naturalistic explanations of the world. This guy just passed away in 2000. Yeah, I know. We're yeah. finally getting to a point. I think one yeah. of these guys passed away in 2003. Oh, So right. one of these that. philosophers was alive when I was. Not him. Not he him. Not WVT. No. <laughs> uh, WVO. Oh, WVO? Yeah. Oh, I can't read my handwriting. That's uh, a, that is I'm definitely reading no. the book. Yes. So. I, have, I, I write my notes in a notebook. He under, underlines things in the book. Yes. I, I don't think we've ever mentioned that before. Jonah was aghast uh, your yeah. brother, that I was writing the book. Yes, I'm I cannot, I cannot write in books. Is that right? Oh, yeah. It drives me crazy. I remember um, in like sixth or seventh grade or something, our English teacher told us to, to write in the books. Yeah. Or we would get points off because she checked our mm -hmm. books for notes. And so I worked around that, and I, have, I had a Kindle at the time uh, to read books, so I got away with it by just, like, highlighting things um, mm -hmm. on my Kindle so I wouldn't have to ruin a book. It's not ruining the book. Oh, it ruins a book. It, it's very much like um, the Half-Blood Prince with the notes in the uh, in the potion book. Uh -huh. He's referencing Harry Potter here. Yeah, yeah. Harry Potter. You know, like the, the Snape. Oh, yes. well, it's a giveaway. Uh, spoiler alert. Yeah, you just completely that's spoiled who the Half-Blood Prince half -blood is. Prince yeah. that, that if he, he put those notes in, it made that book better. Yeah. That, that was that was a gold mine for Harry Potter and his potion-making stuff. I don't think there's going to be many wizards reading your book after you're done with it. Trying to... I don't think anybody will. No, it's really just not. my benefit. Yes. But I told Jonah, well, now when you read it, it's <laughs> a thousand-page, yeah, actually it is over yeah. a thousand, about mm -hmm. a thousand-page book, then you will know what I thought was important on yes. each page. Mm-hmm. So it has, sure is vital it, it, to it'll understand have, this book. Yes. Mm -hmm. And really what it means well, is that when I'm done with this, I'm going to throw it in the trash. Well, you're just going to throw it away? I'm not, but somebody else will. Oh, okay. Because it'll be no, of no use because I've despoiled it. Yes, I suppose With my, so. my underlining and circling and, and exclamation marks and question mm -hmm. marks and various things. Yes. Going back to Quine, uh, Sorry. his analysis of language... <laughs> Uh, he believed that science really depends on language and experience, and that's not so much traced in individual sentences. You know, we don't have to have, you know, language and experience. You know, where do we go into the atoms of language and sentences and that sort of thing? I found his, the discussion of him completely and totally boring. Really? Quine? Yeah. Did mm -hmm. you like it? I don't know. What's the bottom line for him? What Meaning must be explained by mapping sensory stimuli to verbal behavior. 
so we have to describe things. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's essentially essentially what he's saying is that you know when we see something, we have to figure out how to put it into words. Uh, so it's just like the old thing after nine eleven: see something, say something. Do, are you even familiar with that? You probably not heard. really. I mean, I've seen. Yeah, so, sort of so it's, around, it's, it's but... kind of a spooky thing. So, like, you know, there, there's a you know after nine eleven, you know, we're like, oh my gosh, there'd be more attacks, mm-hmm. and so the, the federal government has a spooky motto like if you if, if you see something say something because they thought well if, if i think people... those signs are like still up in airports and stuff aren't is they? that right i think I, so i just think it's so orwellian yeah you know it's like man sometimes well as, as some Patriot people would, as some people in my community would say uh snitches get stitches because that's for my community Lawyers here, here in Festus. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was very confused. What? Okay. <laughs> and moving on to Donald Davidson. That's the opposite of see something, say something. Yes. Those are two competing philosophies. Yes. Of the uh, TSA versus the community of Festus, Missouri. The, fe- the, yes. the Festus, the yes. Anglo-Saxon uh, Catholic. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Festus uh, residents yes. in Missouri. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the snitches get stitches philosophy. Those are two opposite ends of the personal involvement and responsibility mm-hmm. for civic uh, involvement yes. in the criminal justice system. Yes. I think those are polar opposites, aren't they? Yes, they would be polar opposites. Okay, very good. We've established that. Yes. So Donald Davidson has this theory of truth. Uh, which show how component parts of sentences can p- contribute to truth conditions of sentences. So very similar to what we've seen already, but uh, more so verifying you know, the individual parts of sentences. If those are true, we add up the truths in those sentences, makes one big truth for that whole sentence. That, uh, yeah, he just rolled his eyes. I, that's kind of what I think, too. I smirked. Yes. yes. Yeah. And there's Strawson. Are yes. we on to Strawson? Yeah, Peter Strawson. Uh, so he, he died in 06. He was alive when mm-hmm. he, he yes, was when I was three years old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he believed that descriptive metaphysics describes the structure of our thoughts without trying to improve it. So this is kind of varying from, you know, what past philosophers kind of believed and that, you know, we have to continue to improve on things. He just really wanted to describe how we think yeah. and how we feel about the world, essentially. Um, and and his, he said the goal of philosophy was not information, mm-hmm. but understanding. Yes. And I agree with that mm-hmm. as far as philosophy is concerned. Yeah. Yes. So that's understand. actually knowledge. Um, the field of linguistics is kind of all about that principle, yeah, actually. It's really true. just um, cataloging, you know, how people speak. We're not supposed to instruct people how to speak. What if they're using improper grammar? Well, then that's just a dialect. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> dialect this. Yeah. <sighs> yeah yes. anything else on that that topic no that was the last philosopher that was, that was yes. it for for this episode yeah i thought um uh, <laughs> well what uh, uh yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know i don't know I don't, uh, there's a lot of detail about mm-hmm. their beliefs a lot of linguistics a lot of what i hate about philosophy which is talking about how to talk about mm-hmm. it yeah um and and I just kind of get bored with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned this several times, but that's what's really what really bogged me down in debates is you know mm-hmm. those hyper technical people who are like, well, you didn't talk about this properly, you didn't bring up this evidence properly, that sort of right. thing. It's like, well, I'm just here to talk about it. <laughs> like, right? You're, 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 you're yeah. The the uh, technical competitive debate mm-hmm. is uh, not persuasive. Yeah. And what you were focusing on was being per, having a persuasive argument, mm-hmm. as opposed to the technical requirements of a, a formal. Mm-hmm. They were trying debate. to get points rather than. Correct. Actually, yeah, they're, they're trying to get points rather than understanding. Mm-hmm. They're trying to get you know, the format over substance, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's it's frustrating. You have to have the format, but you know, yeah, it's important more important to have the substance. Yes, but you have to have the format because that's what kind of galls me about your comment about the dialect Mm -hmm. i mean and also i think i've mentioned this too that um it also kind of helped me i think at times in these debates is that going up against these hyper technical people mm -hmm. they didn't really know what to do with me (laughs) right right. (laughs) because they're they're also used to everybody you know talking the same way and using the same sort of way of introducing things and that sort of thing and i'm just here to talk and try to persuade right Um, right but it's not like i was intentionally trying to throw them off that was just 
had no formal training, and well, that's and I, just yeah, what I knew how to do. And I th- think if you look at your scores, you always scored better with the uh, non-expert judges mm-hmm. uh, because they were listening to the argument as opposed to the technical requirements yeah. of the debate. And the the debate coaches who judged you were always like, well, you didn't do X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z. And yep. You have to s- announce this you know, criterion and all mm-hmm. Okay, but, you know, it. I, I think, well, of course... I, I I value debate, and I think it's, it's really beneficial. I wish more students would do it, but I think they need to focus on actual persuasive public mm-hmm. speaking and I debate. I think it is important to, to acknowledge that there should be a structure there. So yes. be, of course, right. you know, people yes. talking over each other at all times. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but it when you go like be... the, the criterion, what was the other term that I, I was confused by at the beginning? There was, there was value a... value yeah. criterion and... Um... Oh, I can't there remember another one. Value it's, criterion. It's and... like, well, you have to state your value criterion. Well, I did state mm-hmm. it. I just didn't introduce it as that title, yeah. you know, and you ought to figure it out. But uh, but it's it's not Lincoln. You know, they call it Lincoln Douglas, but it's not Lincoln. Lincoln Douglas was just a free for all, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just took turns going back and forth. Yeah. And uh, and I think that is very very valuable. Just like the logic and language, you know, the, the formal logic structure would really help a lot of people. And I don't think you have to get to the level of a uh, logical yeah, You don't have to go into yeah, the atoms of language. Yeah, and, but... and try to really go to the minutia, but to, to, to formalize it and to organize it mm-hmm. in, in like a math, like addition and subtraction, maybe a little division and multiplication in your logic system. But beyond that, I mean, you don't have to go into so much detail that it gets, it, you end up uh, taking away from the organization of it. And really it's the ideas that are important. Mm-hmm. But uh, you should take some uh, logic classes. Do they offer? They have to offer oh, some I'm sure logic. I'm sure they do. You're not signed up for any. Not freshman year now. <sighs> first semester. Alas. I will be taking Latin, though. Well, that's what you say. I thought you were going to talk about just switching out with something else. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Well, if you're going to be a linguist, you ought to take Latin. Yeah. I think I'm going to minor in classical studies, too. Yeah, you should. Yeah. You should, because... Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty easy to get with overlapping with linguistics, yeah. too. And it's really marketable. Uh, man, mm-hmm. there's so many jobs for classical studies. Uh, Almost as many as there are for linguistics <laughs> majors. <laughs> oh, there's, I, I think there's more jobs for linguistics majors than there were philosophy majors, which is what I was. Oh, probably. I and mean, who hires for uh, somebody with a degree in philosophy? Not many people. There's no job. That they're not qualified to do anything. No. I don't know if I'm really going to be qualified to do anything either, though. Um. Yeah. I think you will be. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can edit a dictionary. Well, I mean, it, it, I think what you're really going to find is is your secondary interests. I, you know, I've, I've found this a lot, that people's secondary interests, their real passions, sometimes really lead them to their career choices. Really? Um, so what's know, my secondary interest? Radio. Oh, okay. Communications. Uh, writing. I'm going to say music. Uh, writing. Well, there's music, too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hard to make a living on yeah, music. That's true. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, hmm. I didn't think about the music as a career choice. You could do it. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, but I, I think you know the, the the communications and the the entertainment and the uh, I think I think you're a talented writer too. So I think I think to be good at radio, I think you have to be a very uh, precise writer too, because mm-hmm. you you got to be able, to, especially if you're doing. <laughs> But, well, I've been on the radio a couple times, local little AM mm-hmm. station, and it was funny. They, they, they'd have, um, like, the news of the day that have to be read. And so I was I was doing that for a little while on uh, one session, and I would do the two-minute news thing. And, and the guys that wrote it uh, wrote it unintentionally phonetically just because they couldn't spell. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought at first it was very jarring, but mm-hmm. then I'm like, oh, that's what they're saying, and so mm-hmm. oh, like it kind of it was almost easier to read really on the radio when it was un- uh, unintentionally spelled phonetically because hmm. you're like it kind of flows off the tongue a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess that's yeah. kind of also to go back to what we we're talking—an argument against kind of that very detailed, you know, approach to language. You know, it has to be you know pictorial and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Is that English doesn't make too much sense. Like, well, yeah, a lot a of structure, the spelling, yeah, structure right. and um, you right. know, phonetically and that sort of thing. Right. So, you know, how much of it is really, you know, so detailed, so planned out to the minutia, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Any yes. other thoughts? I don't know. What are your thoughts? Do you have any more thoughts? I don't have any more thoughts. I think, I think I'm out of thoughts tonight. All right. Well, 
This has been Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. And you can follow us on Twitter. He's going to laugh. Where at? Capital U, <laughs> lowercase <laughs> LMTD, opinions with a capital O. All right. Any tweets yet? Any comments at all? No, of all course right. not. All right. Someday. Someday, hopefully. turned off the air yeah it's very warm which is the other end of the spectrum